morning, everybody. Why don't we, uh, why don't folks come on in, grab a seat, and we'll, we'll get started. If um, I haven't met you yet, I'm John Kroger. I'm the president of the college. And uh, we're, I'm really excited this morning to introduce uh, our speaker. Let me say by way of introduction um, that a question I've heard a lot this weekend is, why do you do this job? And uh, the answer for me is very simple. Um, I left home when I was 17 and enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and was very lucky to go from the Marines to Yale College where I was a philosophy major. And I studied philosophy not because I thought there would be some huge pragmatic life advantage to the study of philosophy. But I, I studied it because it was my passion, it's what I loved, I was trying to figure out the world and that was a really important lens for me to do so. And that was the smartest thing I ever did in my life. Uh, the tools that I got, both to, both to understand the world and, and where my place was in it, what kind of values I wanted to shape my career, all of that stemmed really from academic study of philosophy. Um, it was also surprisingly, from a pragmatic point of view, the most important thing I could do in terms of the later success of my career. I was a lawyer and um, honestly, like the things I learned as a philosophy student, how to take thousands and thousands of pages of very difficult texts and figure out what was interesting to them about me, how to be a sophisticated reader of texts, how to try to find nuance in creatively find nuance where other people could not. All of that came from, for me, the study of philosophy. And so, for me, what's important about Reed and why I love to be here is this is a place devoted to that kind of education. It is a education I have experienced in my own life is utterly transformative and extremely powerful. And to be part of a team of people who are able to preserve and protect and offer that kind of education is just a very moving and, and powerful experience. We're gonna hear this morning from um, George Anders. George is uh, a graduate of Stanford and um, for the past 30 or so years, you don't mind if I outed the 30 years of... Okay, um, the very youthful looking George uh, Anders. Uh, has been a very distinguished uh, business journalist for 30 years. Um, he's written for the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, uh, Bloomberg. He's now uh, at LinkedIn. Uh, George is the author of five books, and his most recent book, which just came out, is uh, called You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of a, quote, useless, end quote, liberal arts education. Uh, and... Um, we're really honored George is here. George spent a lot of time uh, talking with us here at Reed and talking with our graduates um, uh, in the writing of this book, and we're really glad that he's back here to share some of his uh, findings. Um, the last thing I would say, which um, George often buries, but together with uh, colleagues at the Wall Street Journal, um, he won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for um, his coverage of uh, HIV and AIDS along with uh, the Wall Street Journal team back in the 90s. So, um, very distinguished journalist. We're very happy to have him here. Welcome, George. Thanks so much. Good Thanks to be so here. Much. So, this is my first time in the front of Vellum. Uh, when I was doing the book research, I sat up at the top and enjoyed a Hume 10 lecture. And then I was told, come to the breakout sessions. And the lecture was good, but the breakout sessions were astonishing. And there was Something about the way students sort of took turns expressing their views without a, a single dropped moment and without people talking on each other. And I asked how it's done, and they said, that's magic. You have to go to read to find out. So it's, it's one of life's mysteries, but it was a very impressive visit. Uh, let me ask you, how many people here had a chance to hear Dean Julie yesterday? Okay, just about everyone. So there was that wonderful moment toward the end where people said, this has offered me so much clarity on zero to 18. Now I've got a 22-year-old, what do I do next? And Julie had quite a good answer about the parent's role, but at some point this becomes society's role. So that's where the baton gets passed to me. And I'll talk a bit about what you can do with a liberal arts degree. Uh, there is good news. There's a path that works. 
It's a wide path. It's a ingenious, inventive, exciting path. Uh, it's not a mainstream one. And as I go through this talk, we're going to explore all the ways that you have to jump fences and pick locks and sort of break your way into channels that are not necessarily mainstream. But uh, it can work, and it does work, and that's where we're going to be headed. I'm going to start with some very broad, uh, first philosophical and then macroeconomic thoughts about what we mean when we talk about careers and what the current career landscape is. And then as I go through the talk, I'll gradually get more tactical and we'll start talking about specific ways that talented people can get the work that's right for them. Uh, and then I will try and leave enough time for questions because uh, as my speaking agent always tells me, the more your audience talks, the more they feel they've learned. And I've got a bright group here. I've got an energetic group. You've come a long way. So um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A section. Uh, so let's start with how we think about careers. Uh, there's a trope that runs through American history in almost any decade you choose, where we've got this tug of war between, on the one hand, the view that America's all about reinventing yourself, doing different things. I put up Teddy Roosevelt on one side and Maya Angelou as well. And these are people who were historians, they were writers, the, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's case, he was you know, briefly a military commander, he was a rancher, Maya Angelou has been a poet, a director, and there's something that's exciting and wonderful to us about the sense that you can remake yourself, that you don't just settle into one field. And then on the other side, we've got this view that pick one specialty and do it. You know, become the best orthopedic surgeon you can be. Uh, I have Ruth Bader Ginsburg here. If you're going to be a Supreme Court justice, you are probably a lawyer, a judge, an advocate your whole life. And there's honor in both paths. There's great success in both paths. And I like it when we have sort of a fairly even tug of war between the two. What's happened right now, though, is we've ended up with a tremendous imbalance. That just about all of the rhetoric, all of the advice, all of the stuff that you hear from, whether it's governors or um, employers or the job market or the media, you know, puts a premium on locking in your plan, playing it safe, picking one thing. There are now calls that people at age 18 should decide their college major. When I came to college, I knew about 10% of what existed in the world. I knew what my dad did. I had a faint idea of what my uncle did. I knew what the guy downstairs in our apartment building did. That was about all I knew about work. And there were all kinds of fields I had not met yet. And I think part of the excitement of college in America is the chance to explore new areas. And yet we're in a world where there's data already on you know, what your first year earnings are going to be with degrees and a tremendous push to vocationalize everyone. And um, we need nurses, we need accountants, we need people with vocational backgrounds, but that's not the only way to go through life. Uh, I'm arguing this in part because when you actually look at the data, we're not in a world where you make one choice, you sign on for a German-style apprentice, and that's who you're going to be for the next 40 years. We're in a world that prizes mobility. So uh, this is Bureau of Labor Statistics data on how many jobs people have depending on their level of education between ages 22 and 28. If all you've got is a high school degree, you have 4.7 jobs. If you've got a community college degree, 5.2. If you've got a full four-year college degree, 5.8. And people switch jobs. I mean, some of this is promotions within a field, but a lot of it also is people trying out one thing and then switching to another. Uh, I'm watching this play out in living time with my oldest niece who started out working for Apple and evaluated apps and discovered that was a sweatshop existence where you have to click on a new app every six minutes and she wanted out. She traveled around the world and now she's in Austin, Texas selling real estate. And I have no idea what she's going to do in a year. Uh, she is somewhere on that progression toward her 5.8 and I don't know if she's at 3 or 4 or whether she's found it, but it'll probably all work out. She's a much more interesting person to talk with now. She's got more self-confidence. And yet, we don't lionize that kind of career path. We, you know, we stress about what people are going to do for their first job, and we want everything to be as predictable as possible. So one of the reasons I wrote the book is to not just tell people that people move jobs this often, but to talk about why that's so and how you can make that work to your advantage. So why does making a fresh start matter so much? Uh, what you've got up on the board, hopefully you can see it, but if not, I'll narrate it. Uh, there are four types of jobs that the Federal Reserve tracks. So uh, they divide between cognitive jobs and manual labor jobs, and between routine and non-routine. And you think, okay, cognitive's got to be better than manual labor. 
routine, non-routine, not sure I understand that difference, don't know how important that is. Actually, when you look at the numbers, the big difference the last 20 or 30 years has been, are you working in a field that's pretty routine described, or are you working in a field where you're inventing a little bit of every, every day? And it's the non-routine jobs, whether it's high-end brainy jobs or manual labor jobs, where there's growth. Uh, and this is true whether you're a partner in a law firm or whether you're a you know, uh, management consultant or whether you're a landscaper or a construction worker. If you're doing something a little different every day, you've got a job that the machines can't touch. If you're doing something that's a very repeatable job, it's simple to learn. You may feel you have security. You don't. Uh, this is a bad time to be a, um, a toll collector. It's a bad time to be a bank teller. It's a bad time to be an electric meter inspector. There's now Wi-Fi devices that will tell you what's on your meter, and that's a job that doesn't exist anymore. What's causing us a lot of stress in the labor market is realizing that it's not just the $10 an hour, $15 an hour jobs, but there are even some $100,000 an hour jobs that are on the path to being automated. Uh, Bloomberg just did a really interesting report on all the ways that Wall Street's going to get automated, and that loan underwriter, that credit assurance person, uh, those Wall Street traders on you know, Bridgewater, a giant firm, is taking out a lot of its analysts and replacing them with quants. So it, you know, the, the takeaway from this, find a job where you need ingenuity, you need inventiveness. And the next couple slides will bear that out in more detail. So we've got the 20th century division, cognitive and manual, and we've got a couple examples of each. And we've got what I call the 21st century division, which is routine versus non-routine. Uh, I've color-coded, I've attached as much emotional uh, messaging to this as I can, so <laughs> routine is not good, routine is red, non-routine is good, that's green. Uh, and what do we see when we look at non-routine? We see the designer, we see the person sort of uh, bringing visual elegance and beauty and a sense of aesthetics. Uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but where do you learn a sense of aesthetics? You learn it literally in this room, you know, figuratively in this campus and in campuses like this. You can get paid for that. You can have you know, a, a career that will take you to a lot of interesting places doing that. Even on the non-routine manual side, healthcare is a gigantic growth area at every level of the income curve. And that goes all the way from the surgeon in the middle of the operating room to the care technician who's wheeling people in, uh, around. And it's that way because there's a lot of hands-on human contact, because there's a lot of stuff that can't be mechanized, and because as our population gets older, and particularly our generation, uh, not only do we want to live a long time, we want to live at the capacity that we had at 35 or 18. And thus, we, we go in for no end of care, and you know, uh, that creates a lot of jobs. So uh, more Bureau of Labor Statistics data, but uh, I love telling stories, but every now and then people go, are you cherry picking stories? So you're getting the data rich version today. Uh, but I'll narrate the slides and we'll not make this too painful. Uh, where can you find work that's growing at three, four, five times the rate of the economy? Uh, nurse practitioners, statisticians, financial advisors, genetic counselors. And this is a fascinating example. We've got all this genetic technology. Somehow you have to get people comfortable with what the, uh, the assays and the tests say. And that requires as much a sense of human relations and psychology as it does knowing what the C's and G's and T's and A's are telling you. Uh, interpreters, translators, therapists, behavioral counselors, market research. This is a field that's growing faster than computer programming and no one writes about it. Uh, let me ask you, how many people have taken a survey within the last 30 days of how you liked your airline or how you liked your vet or how you like read or anything? Okay, yes. We've now created technology that's taken us from the days of the clipboard or the envelope that you send back with the dollar that comes with. And whether it's SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics or other vendors like this, we can survey people at an incredible rate. Uh, even though the core surveying is automated, someone needs to think of the right questions to ask, and someone needs to evaluate what we've learned. The job of asking the right questions, and again, where do you learn to ask good questions? You learn it at places like this. Uh, it's not taught in the vocational programs. And you know, if you're looking for what's a field that pays sixty dollars to $90,000 a year, uses a college degree, is interesting work and incredibly transferable, uh, you know, if you love coding, learn coding. If you just want to you know, put your inventive, creative mind to work, the market research field is booming. Uh, so big macro point in the, the book, I identify three traits that we can do and machines can't. 
And they are creativity, curiosity, and empathy. Uh, you can't have a rule-based system until you have enough data to run on, the rules on. So in a way, anytime we can find a field that's new, that requires fresh approaches, uh, that's going to be valuable. Uh, anytime we can think of solutions that are not obvious, uh, someone took an AI program and decided to go, okay, could we come up with paint colors uh, if we um, turn loose an, an AI system and give it a whole dictionary of words? And they gave it various palettes of brown, and boom, up comes deep turdly. And <laughs> if, if you're... If you're in the naming business, you can rest easy that the machines are not about to take away your job. They, they haven't quite figured it out yet. And by extension, there are an awful lot of other creative fields, whether it's slogans, whether it's design. These are still human fields, and these are fields where an eye for what's beautiful, what's true, what's clear is, is valuable. Uh, empathy is the biggest circle, and there's a reason for that. The ability to connect person to person is so transformative in so many fields. Uh, why do we have the placebo effect? Because people believe that what they've been given is going to help them and they've been handed it to them by someone who they trust. Uh, when we, you know, why do cancer patients survive longer when we have, you know, hands-on contact and nurses and doctors who care? Uh, we're a very social species. We like human contact. And I worry that some of the technologists think that we can automate that out. Uh, why do students learn more in small classes? Why is one-on-one -on -one tutoring even more effective? That ability to think that someone cares about you, incredibly valuable. And uh, as we automate the routine, I think the ability to bring people in to do the human piece um, is absolutely essential. Uh, so because I live in Silicon Valley, I end up hearing a lot of the calls of everyone should learn to code. Uh, there's nothing wrong with learning to code. We need a certain number of coders, but when you look at job growth the last five years, 6% of the growth, about 600,000 jobs, come in uh, information technology broadly defined. And that's not just software coding, that's network engineering and IT management. 94% of the job growth happens in areas other than the core tech. Uh, so let's go look at some of them that are you know, touched by tech, influenced by tech. Uh, user experience, uh, you've all been on sites that you felt I can navigate this quickly and smoothly and on ones where you go, I'm lost, I'm stuck, I keep circling back, I can't find the button they want me to get to. It takes human judgment to get there. Project management, the ability to get everyone playing together, it's much like being the conductor in an orchestra. You aren't touching any of the instruments yourself, but you've got the baton and you make it all come together. Even the field of data analytics, we've got software now that runs the numbers. We need someone who can tell stories around the numbers. What are the numbers that matter? Uh, so again, these are exciting fields. These are fields that they'll make extremely good use of liberal arts graduates who've got just enough statistics, just enough design to be able to do it. But uh, I open the book with the story of an anthropology major from Bard. And Reed will always be my favorite example of the purest, most intense liberal arts experience, but Bard gives you guys a good run for the money. <laughs> and you know, he comes out with an anthro degree uh, from Bard, and it takes him a while to find his right job, but he is now, uh, when I interviewed him, he was a user experience frontline guy at um, uh, Etsy, the arts marketplace. One of the things about being in George's book is your career usually takes off. So he is now a manager who runs a whole UX team. And they're the ones who, you know, he goes out and does field research. He talks to artists and asks them, you know, what would make our site work better? And that deep anthropological way of he understands everything from their childhood to their best friend to what have you. And then he's got a better sense of how to make it all work. So anthropology put to use. Uh, I grew out of, I came out of the Wall Street Journal, as John had mentioned, and our whole style there was to find big, important trends, document them with data, and then go get the best examples we could. And, you know, preferably travel far, stay up late, go out for beers with people. You know, the, the getting of the story became its own adventure. And it's a habit I've never been able to break. So uh, just to give you a few examples of people in the book, the first example, Cliff, Cliff Latham is a psychology major. He's now um, building out surveys and using his sense of what people want, human desires, to infuse that. Uh, Andy Anderegg is a wonderful story. She was an English major from Kansas. Um, 
She ended up at Groupon writing those sassy, jaunty emails that would convince you that there's nothing you want to do more than go bowling. <laughs> and whatever else you think of social media, it is the full employment act for English majors because someone has to come up with those clever tweets. I, I, I saw today, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken has only 11 people that it follows. Five of them are the Spice Girls, and the other six are people named Herb, because KFC Chicken is made with 11 spices and herbs. <laughs> you won't get a business major doing that. You need an English major. You need someone with a sense of humor and playfulness, and <laughs> there's no end of companies that want that. Uh, and I've, I've saved the best for last. Um, is anyone in financial services? OK. Does anyone understand blockchain? OK, they, they, you're, you're in like the uh, top 1% of America. Um, there's this sense of, wow, this is this enormous wave coming, and traditional money and even plastic is going to, at some stage, be subsumed by this amazing sort of electronic ledger system that you know, we know is Bitcoin now, but eventually it'll be cleaned up and legitimate, and that's the future of banking. Uh, and I've explained it badly and only in bullet points, but deep down there's an awful lot of engineering there. Who's going to bring the blockchain concepts to the rest of the world? It's not going to be the engineer who's deep inside the code. It's going to be someone who's an explainer and someone who understands the hesitancy and the reticence of everyone else in the room. So when IBM forms its negotiating team to introduce blockchain to Walmart, who do they put in the room? They put a sociology major because he's got a sense of that dynamic. And I include this example because it seems outlandish. And then I was doing a talk to a bunch of tech people, and one of them puts up his hand and he goes, I work for Intuit. We have a blockchain team. We actually use a poli sci major for it. And there you go. I mean, sometimes that ability to see across the walls, to unify different ideas, to understand different perspectives, ends up being the most valuable skill of all. And yes, you need technical expertise within the project. But at the capstone level, you need someone who can put it all together. Uh, the points that I'm making, the, now the question is, is this just me preaching to the choir, or are, is there a wide acceptance of this in the business and employment community? And this is a tantalizing question I'm wrestling with, because when you look at the very highest levels, the message has sunk in. And I'm going to give you three examples from the world of tech where they've basically bought into everything we've talked about so far. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about whether that's permeated any farther. So the first one is from Anand Agarwal. Uh, he runs edX, which is a online learning system that MIT and Harvard have set up. He's got his own very popular electrical engineering class. And this is a guy who knows everything about circuits. And yet, what's his takeaway quote? It's about the importance of soft skills. Uh, Satya Nadella is the CEO of Microsoft. And he has positioned Microsoft from a, you know, how good were your SAT scores and how many golf balls does it take to fill a 747 to the kind of place where it's not a know-it-all culture anymore, it's a learn-it-all culture. And that's much more what you'll find at institutions like Reed, that curiosity, that desire to expand knowledge, that sense that knowledge is not a finite amount that's, you know, in a jar and once you, you know, open the jar and spoon it all out, you have all knowledge. Knowledge is an expanding field. So yeah, at the highest levels of a place like Microsoft, it's there. Uh, this is the late Maryam Merzakhani, who was the first woman to win a field medal, which is the mathematics world equivalent of a Nobel Prize. Uh, alas, we, we lost her to cancer earlier this year. But she's incredibly inventive in fields of geometry that go far beyond anything I'd ever thought was geometry. But it's a world that she thrived in. And here she talks about being in the big forest, not knowing where you are, and then trying to figure it out. And that sense of being on the edge of knowledge is something that, if you're comfortable there, if you can push yourself out there, it's amazing what you can accomplish. And it's also frustrating, kind of jarring for me to realize how many people don't live in that world, that they just want to be told what to do. They just want to have a script. And if you or your sons and daughters are comfortable operating in the forest that she describes, there is a world of opportunity. And whether it's a field medal or something else, uh, the chance to make a difference, to be a leader, is incredible. Uh, let me just hold before we get to that slide. So if only everyone thought that way, they don't. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to get to why these ideas haven't fully caught on and what we can do to increase their, their presence. Uh, more data. You're probably thinking, if only George gave me more data. But uh, we do data presentation, too. Uh, this is a very intricate and complicated but fun chart that Williams does showing on the left side all of its students' majors 
and on the right side where they end up professionally. The blue are the arts, the uh, orange are the social sciences, the green are technology-related fields. Uh, I could take you through you know, how the linguistics majors end up in law and how the history majors end up in education and how you know, people end up in sales and finance and what have you, but the Maypole effect is really all you need to take away from this. Your major does not decide who you are. Uh, your opportunities are incredible and the ability to move from one field to another is huge. Uh, everyone who tries to chart out a course at age 18 and say you will hit all these checkpoints is missing the opportunity to, to enjoy this really interesting ride through life. Um, so when I say your major is not your destiny, um, the Hamilton Foundation, which is an offshoot of Brookings, did a three million person survey of where people end up given their majors. And I've marked them in two different categories. The top ones are the true vocational majors. If you get a nursing degree, there's a 71% chance you will end up being a registered nurse. That's kind of how it works. That's why you go to nursing school. And then the other positions tend to be hospital administration, uh, medical management. They're very closely allied. Accounting, pretty much the same thing. Uh, but once you get past those kind of fields, what's so striking about American majors is they take you to different places. And you certainly expect that for majors like history. Uh, and the most common thing that history majors become apparently is lawyers but some of them become legislators, some of them become CEOs or other C-level executives. 2% of them go into the clergy, and I usually am just sitting still in church and don't you know, shut down my inquisitive side because that's not actually how church works. But uh, you know, if you ask enough priests and ministers, what did you study in addition to the divinity school ones, you will find history majors. But the reason I'm putting up this slide is even fields like physics and chemistry, I mean pure STEM fields, most physics majors actually don't end up becoming physicists. A lot of them end up in software, uh, some of them end up in biology, uh, many of them end up teaching at all sorts of different levels. It's a degree that can take you a lot of different places. Chemistry, the same thing. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll do a couple slides that do this as word clouds. So this is the history major word cloud and you know, all kinds of different areas you can go there. Um, this is the physics major word cloud. I mean, it's a little more technically oriented, but again, you find some of them ending up in law school, aerospace engineers, high school teachers. The kind of degrees that you can get at a good representative American college can take you all kinds of places. And as I said, I wrote the book in part because I felt this message was getting lost. I felt people were looking for a vocational lock-in. And um, I don't, the, there, the opportunities are abundant. I think the only thing that stops people from appreciating these opportunities is when they get too shy and timid and frightened. And part of making these opportunities happen is knowing how to come into a job interview boldly or knowing how to meet people at an airport or a cocktail party or you know, Burning Man or whatever your setting for negotiating is. Um, Reed has a wonderful story of how you can meet people at Burning Man. So if you, if you run into a Reed administrator and need something to talk about, ask about the, the networking power of, of Burning Man. Uh, but the, the broad point is there, you, you know, get out, meet people. And uh, we've all done that to some degree in our careers and as we think about what our sons and daughters should be doing, uh, that kind of mingling uh, just open, starts to open all of the, the points on the pinwheel. Uh, so in the book, I tell the story of people who rebuild their careers early and often. Uh, this is Polly Washburn, she's an Oberlin graduate. And in the course of her career, she got her degree in law and society. She's been a legal researcher, she's been a journalist, she spent a couple time, years doing independent films, she's been a web developer, she's been a digital producer. And you're probably starting to see, you know what, there is a pattern to these jobs. They're, yes, they're different fields, but they all require an ability to combine creativity and good research building skills with an ability to build a team together, to you know, uh, weave in other people's input. And the actual medium may change, but the kinds of things that made her good at one of those jobs will make her good at other jobs too. Uh, so again, the kinds of opportunities that are open. Uh, even so, you know, when I, when I did the book, one, people always ask me, what's the big surprise when you did your book? And to me, it was how bashful and not quite scared, but sort of startled people were to find that someone actually wanted to come and talk to them about their career journeys and to treat them seriously. And there, there was almost the sense that they had slipped across the border, that their papers weren't quite in order, and they'd found a good job, but that this was 
slightly seditious behavior and the kind of thing that the authorities could pull you over for. And <laughs> we shouldn't be that kind of society. We should welcome and celebrate people who do this. So, you know, again, I'm, I've got a couple more examples. In the middle is my anthropology major, Josh. Um, but we've got a philosophy major who runs a, um, you know, sales technology company. We've got an English major to the left, Nikelia Henderson. Uh, she's the one who tells stories with numbers, and you can follow her work on the hashtag bow down to the data. And once again, you know, is a data scientist ever going to put up their work that way? No. Is an English major going to know that's the way to let your stuff be known? Yes. And that ability to fuse left brain and right brain and bring it all together, uh, it's glorious. It's wonderful, and it will employ a lot of people in the years to come. And I just encourage you as you talk to, you know, your sons and daughters' generation, you know, take pride in these kinds of opportunities that are open. If they're headed that way, cheer them on. It does work. I don't know where they're going to be in their 5.6 or 5.8 job hop, but it generally works out. Um, so I, I'd said we've got this pipeline. It's rusty. And I'm going to take you through quickly the five different pieces where I want to get tactical and talk about what can we do to you know, treat, switch from regarding these kinds of career journeys as one-of-a-kind anomalies to starting to regard this as mainstream. Uh, so we'll start with colleges, the purple circle. Uh, I think a generation ago, career services, certainly when I went, the feeling was you type up your resume, you wait for people to come to the job booth, you sign up, you sit in a little cubicle that's about the size of a toilet and about as friendly, and then you try and explain your story in the hopes that they will sign you up. Um, I, I have a little bit of personal history here because I bombed every single interview and I, I flunked the cup of coffee test with Citi and I went in about two minutes from being the candidate they wanted to hire to the person who couldn't figure out if they wanted milk or cream and once I couldn't figure out if I wanted milk or cream I clearly couldn't make loan decisions so that's why I did not become a loan officer and I, I kind of had to make a go of it on the other side but it's worked out okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm not here to you know, disparage the you know, traditional job booth that works for some people but what works a lot more for the kinds of students that you know, are my children and perhaps your children too is a world where you spend much more time researching the fields you're interested in, rubbing shoulders with the kinds of people who work in that field and figuring out, do I like the kind of people who go into public service and government? Can I shadow one of those jobs? Can I spend a little bit of time getting to know them? And then building those informal connections into the kinds of places that say, you know what, we've got an opening coming up. Would you like to apply for it? Or we'd love to get you in. Let's talk about the way we can structure a job for you. The actual shipping of resumes may be only 10% of what you do. And it's more of a formality at the end once you've built the relationship rather than the starting point. Uh, there's data from um, Lever, one of the uh, HR companies, that it takes 152 resume mailings to get a job. And on the network side, it's 18 to 20 contacts will get you to a successful job. Uh, we've automated the resume process. Most big companies are looking for keywords, and they are deluged. They can't get through all the resumes. So, you know, cold calling on a resume, hard way to get a job, meeting the kind of people who can hire you, vastly better. And you know, I, I spend time, every time I come to read, I talk with Alice, who is in the front row, and uh, Alice inspires me. She's got a great take on HR and on the career world. I, I learn every time about ways that she's helped students find jobs. So you've got a great resource here at Reed. Reed is not only putting this strategy to work, it's, it's taking it into new directions. And uh, it's exciting to see uh, how new paths can be built. Uh, for students, so the key message here is you probably have to invent your own job. If you're waiting for someone to come and tell you exactly how they want to hire you, that will work if you're a fermentation engineer. DuPont needs fermentation engineers, and they will tell you exactly what to do. Uh, schools like Reed do not provide that kind of very intense, single focus uh, job training. So there's data from the University of Chicago that says uh, when they look at how jobs happen, they, you know, being good U of C economists, will analyze how many job listings are posted, when do they get filled. And they found 42% of jobs happen without there being a job posting, which is to them the equivalent of dark matter to astronomers. It's one of these things where you go, how can that even happen? But what they are reluctantly realizing is a lot of jobs happen without getting posted. And you know, if, you're, if you've got the you know, human to human skills, the empathy, the curiosity, the creativity of a liberal arts major, this is your place to go to town. 
Um, find the people who are capable of inventing jobs or invent one your own, build your own startup, build your own consulting business. Uh, go into organizations that are expanding in unpredictable ways. Look at their websites, see what they're, they're trying to do. Use alumni connectors to, to get to know them and build your own job. And the wonderful thing about building your own job, I've done that a couple times in my life, no one has ever done the job better than you. You are the first person to do it, so whatever you do to find success in that field, it's a lot more fun than coming into an area where, um, in fact, I have a, a mentor from long ago who told me two things. One, never take a job that the last two people did poorly, because it's probably impossible to do well. But by the opposite, if you take a job that the last two people did brilliantly, you're, you've got tough comparisons. So work in a world where you don't get compared. Uh, social capital. Okay, we now get to do a Reed alumni story. Uh, so this is Kauri Freda. She was, I think, class of 2015. Uh, and she had an um, interdisciplinary major with elements of design and uh, other fields. Uh, after graduation, she did the perfect read thing. She not only went to Japan to visit her grandmother, she signed on to be a volunteer teacher in a school and then ended up going to an eco-lodge in the Ogasawara Islands, which are a 25-hour ferry ride south of Tokyo, and ended up working in an eco-lodge there. And I'm sure her parents were going, Kaori, we, we paid for four years of college and you're working in an eco-lodge and you know, uh, you're cleaning out the chicken coops and you're building the goat shed. How long is this going to last? And the answer for her was somewhere around trying to, you know, the second or third month of building the goat shed. She goes, you know what, I actually need to get back to the States. I need to find something to do. And here I am in this, you know, mountainside island place. What do I do? She's a Reed grad. She's got connections. And she knew someone at Nike and reached out to him and he said, we've got openings that you might match. I can set up some Skype interviews for you. I cannot hire you. It's gonna be dependent on the people you meet. You're gonna to need to make a really good impression. This is a competitive job. And then she uses actually technology developed by another Reed alum that lets her connect with people from the class of 92, the class of 98, and they're all coaching her of here's what you need to know about Adobe Photoshop, here's what you need to know about Adobe Illustrator, here's some nuancey things about the Nike culture. And she sets up her Skype interview. She looks around in her little cabin and she realizes they're termite trails, but you know, even if that's not gonna look good on the, the Skype image, uh, she gets her bed sheet, she neatly tacks it up, and if you set the focus settings just right, you can't tell the difference between a bed sheet and a really nice uh, plasterboard wall. So Nike feels they're interviewing her in a conference room. She's got the desk set up, she's got the webcam, and happy ending, a couple weeks later, she's hired by Nike. So why am I telling you this outlandish story? I'm telling you because every student who comes out of a school like this has got an incredible network of hundreds and even thousands of people who are rooting for them. And these are the people who are the class of 2016, 15, 14, 13, and they're connected. They go work at the kinds of places you might want to be. There's something about alumni, really from any school, either it's protecting the brand or it's a sense of kinship or it's this extended family that you never had. You take care of each other. And I think there's an enormous resource. I'm encouraging people, particularly ones who are looking for unexpected jobs, to make the greatest use they can of alumni contacts. You've got a rich, rich pool here. Uh, it's the kind of thing where parents can step back and the students do the work, particularly with recent graduates. They're talking to people who are very much like themselves. You don't have that barrier of trying to approach someone who's been in the field 20 years. And doors open. Uh, I think this is especially important as uh, elite schools broaden their, uh, the populations that they address. And uh, I'm seeing it a lot of campuses, um, whether it's Amherst, Franklin and Marshall, Reed here, uh, others where there's a desire to open the doors to people who might not come in with the amount of family social capital that other people do. They're first generation college students. They don't have grandfathers who are ambassadors or senators or what have you. I think it's great that schools admit people with you know, whatever level of social capital they have. I don't think there's any reason people should graduate with different levels. So the more that can be done to use alumni tools so that everyone comes out going, I've got a full strength network, the better. And that will lead to jobs. Uh, it's something that needs work, though. It's not something that happens automatically. So I put that on the table as something of, you know, sophomore, junior year, are you meeting the kind of people that can help open doors for you later? And are you meeting them on a basis where you enjoy them? And a word that we don't often hear in networking is affection. 
and Mara Zepeda, who's the Reed alum who set this up, brings affection into the conversation. If you genuinely like the people on both sides, it's so much better than if you're just collecting business cards and asking for favors. Uh, for employers, um, this is frustrating for me because I've been trying to win this argument for about seven or eight years and I'm not sure I'm winning it at all. But I did an earlier book called The Rare Find that made the case for hiring people with jagged resumes, for looking at people not so much of what are their flaws, but what are their strengths. And I still see a lot of hiring that's based on the you know, opt out, kick out process of let's get 100 candidates and then think of reasons not to like 98 of them. Uh, and so often you lose that unusual candidate who's got strengths. I did hear the head of Facebook's talent, Lori Goler, talk up a, a really interesting new approach to interviewing, and I've got her key quote up there, which is instead of running people through a whole gauntlet of hard to answer questions, just ask people to describe their best day. And it's amazing the answers you'll get. I mean, one, it's a very friendly, inviting question, so people open up. But you'll also get a sense of what are people's strengths? What motivates them? What excites them? What kinds of settings do they do their best work? And then occasionally you'll get someone whose idea of a best day is so radically different than anything you ever want inside your place of employment that it also does your screen outs. But mostly it helps you recognize talent that you might not see otherwise. Um, and then the last area, which is us. Uh, this is going to mirror something that Julie says, but you know, I, I'll, I'll come to you with slightly different imagery. Uh, it's both exciting and scary to see our children moving through space and unbounded space. And I think we tend to see tight ropes very often, the image on the left. And we tend to think of getting a career as a tight rope or professional success as a tight rope. And there are a few fields where that's true. If you want to be an Air Force fighter pilot, you have got to clear gauntlet after gauntlet after gauntlet. If you want to be a heart transplant surgeon, you've got to you know, do your APs, ACE your MCATs, get into the right residency programs, the list goes on and on. Most fields are not like that. And if there's one thing I've tried to show with the slides, it's that an awful lot of moving through space is being on a trampoline. And you probably will fall at some point, but you will bounce up. And there's sometimes even something about that fall that lets you do your next jump or leap or maneuver. Um, so think about what lies ahead is a series of trampoline jobs rather than you know, the quest for that one tightrope job. Uh, just to sum it all up with a single aphorism, uh, and I learned this doing Wall Street Journal interviews, one of the top investors of the world said, all of my associates and analysts and junior people come in, they tell me what can go wrong with the stock. There's always something that can go wrong. I've made most of my money by asking what can go right. And that question, what can go right, is really powerful. And I just encourage you to bring it to conversations, especially that tie into you know, people graduating from college or approaching the job market. That is everything I know, but you know a lot, <laughs> and I would love to open it up for your questions. Thanks. <laughs>